Good evening, friends. I'm Dr. Ajay Shah, and we are bringing you this another uh, Facebook Live for the evening. Today, I have a special guest, which you absolutely will enjoy. You will learn. Matter of fact, uh, you will actually advance your pocket money too. So let's wait for that uh, great guest. Let me give you an update on our page. We have now about 70,000 followers all over the world. We have expanded our six pillars, six original pillars into now 18 to 20 pillars. We are doing uh, women empowerment. We are doing some live cooking shows. Uh, we are on YouTube. We have about 30 videos on YouTube now. We are bringing all different type of guests, including guests to uh, keep you healthy and happy, and also guests to advance into all the aspects of being a successful person. So we definitely are trying to you know, cater you in every aspect uh, for you to be uh, successful uh, in a way. Uh, so tonight's guest is Brandon Carter. He's actually a financial planner. He obviously, and I know him for some time now, expert in his field. He has actually his own company with his family. He's a great family man, great father, great husband, and now a great friend. So he's kind of kind enough to come in the evening on his vacation day. So teach us about day-to-day uh, uh, -day financial matters. So let's, uh, let's welcome Brandon. Welcome, Brandon. Hello, Dr. Shah. Well, thanks for coming, Brandon. We have got a lot of great questions for you. So hopefully after we finish with you, uh, we'll be knowing how to take care of our finances. So please yeah, tell thanks us- thanks for where having you, me. Where do you live and what is your education background? Yeah, I live in between the Flint and Lansing area in Michigan. So kind of a small town called Corona. And uh, my educational background is I went to Swartz Creek High School here locally and then went to Central Michigan University. Uh, where I was a wrestler and got a degree in entrepreneurship uh, with an emphasis in finance. I went on to get my master's degree in financial services from the American College of Financial Services and uh, became or, or earned the Certified Financial Planner designation, uh, Chartered Financial Consultant, um, Certified Investment Management Analyst, and Accredited Estate Planner designations. Wow, that's impressive. That's impressive. So Thank you. Yeah, so tell us about your company. Where is it located? How many people work with you? And who are the planners in that company? What's the name of it? Yes, our company is Financial Strategies Group, family-owned company. My dad's been in the business for 32 years. Um, my brother's also a financial advisor, certified financial planner. Um, my sister is our operations manager. She's our chief operations officer and manages three of our offices, which are all based in Michigan. So we have an office in the Lansing area, an office in the Flint area, and one in Northville. Um, yeah, so that's that's the rundown. We have about 14 employees, seven financial advisors. Um, so we're you know smaller company, but um, growing and and doing well. Yeah, definitely. I think you guys are doing great. We have we definitely had a great experience so far with you. So please Thank let's you. just start with the. What is the current status of our stock market? Everybody was afraid in March what was going on. Now it partially has recovered. So what do you think the current status is in terms of stock market? Yeah, so it, it's uh, that's a great question. It's been a crazy year in a lot of different ways and the stock market is, is a prime example of that. So we started out the year um, with the market going up pretty significantly the first month or so. It kind of extended a rally that had in 2019 the market great positive returns in 2019. And then we started to see uh, COVID-19 coronavirus becoming more and more of an issue as it became more of an, more of an issue. Um, people realized that it was gonna have a major impact on the economy, the market started going down. And really what turned it around, because the economy is still struggling, um, businesses are still, the profits down, unemployment's high, but turned it around has been the government intervention, both in the US and, and internationally. Um, the Federal Reserve here in the United States has pumped a ton of money into the economy and um, you know, the, lots of stimulus checks and loans to businesses have come from the federal government and that has brought the market stability and it's, you know, S&P 500 is right around where it was at the beginning of the year right now. Uh, so, so to ask you the question, we had almost like 10, 10, 11 year of bull market. So in March, do you think we enter the recession uh, by definition? Yes, yeah, it's pretty much uh, consensus now that we are in a recession. Okay. Uh, so if uh, people, 
you know, unfortunately, a lot of people right now are kind of short on the cash and they don't have much result left to invest into stock market. But at the same time, people always said, the expert always said that when the stock market is down, that's the best time to buy the stock. So what do you, what do you think in terms of buying uh, stocks right now? Do you think people should stay on the sideline time being or do you think people should jump in at this time? Yeah, that's very situational. That's a real tough question to answer without talking to somebody about where they're at, how close to retirement they are, all those types of things. Um, so in, in general, we try to avoid making predictions about what the market's going to do, because just when you are confident that it's going to do one thing, it's going to do the exact opposite. It's a very hard thing to predict. And so we try to make our decisions based more on uh, fundamentals. So good academic research, um, long-term planning strategies and try not to let the day-to-day -day fluctuations of the market distract us from really the overall goal, which is achieving this person's objectives within the risk tolerance and within their situation. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I think uh, people who stay in stock market in the long term, they actually end up doing better than uh, people who just keep buying at low or selling at high because that strategy typically, you know, whatever I learned from a person like you, that strategy most of the time actually fails. And I think people who try to time the market versus just stay in the market, uh, people who stay in the market end up doing better long term. You agree with that? I do agree with that. Yeah. For the most part, and there's several studies that show this, uh, the more you play with your money, the more you get in and get out and, and try to time the market, the worse your returns are going to be. Um, they give you peace of mind because you're thinking you're protecting yourself from downturns. Um, but actually, in the long run, it hurts, hurts your returns for the most part, yeah. I think I, I learned one uh, lesson hard way that if you are an expert in a field, I'm talking about non-financial field, it will be probably better off for you and smarter of you to put your energy, efforts, resources into your own field because the amount of return you can get in your own field will be much higher than trying to market that at the time the market because, for example, if I, as a physician, if I put all my efforts into earning money as a physician, I probably will beat the market any day. But if I try to be a, a stock broker, I probably will lose. So I think my general kind of general experience and advice to the people who are younger than me that stay in your own field, work hard in your own field. If you're in a business, put all your efforts into your own business, invest back into your own business, and just keep your own field growing and growing instead of keep trying to time the market. So I agree with you. I think, uh, I think that's great advice. The world is so complicated today. You know, you can only be an expert in so many things. Yeah. So I think uh, the basic question for many of the young viewers and many of us too, is please explain us, what is the, what does it mean to buy a stock? What does it mean to buy a bond? And what it means to buy treasuries? That's a great question. That is a very good question. So a uh, stocks or ownership, uh, when you buy a share of Coca-Cola, for example, you're actually part owner of the company. And you can benefit in a couple of different ways. If Coca-Cola does really well, sells a lot of product and expands their company, builds new factories, grows, you know, it sees good, you can see the stock price rise. So if you bought it for $50 a share and it's at 60, you've, you've made return. Or they can kick back some of those profits to you in the form of a dividend. Uh, which is basically profit sharing from, from a corporation. So stocks are ownership. You may be a teeny tiny little fraction of an owner of Coca-Cola, but you're actually part owner. Um, bonds are debt. Bonds are loans. So essentially you are being the bank. You are loaning money to either a government, a corporation, or a municipality. Um, so government, corporation, and municipality. Um, there's lots of different types of bonds, um, but the basic type of bond is just a fixed rate traditional bond. They can be anywhere from one month to... 30 years, I haven't seen 100 year bonds now. Um, so you're essentially agreeing to loan money to, I could just call it a corporation, but we'll use Coca Cola as an example there. Coca Cola sells bonds, you buy a 10 year bond at 3%. So that means you're agreeing to loan them a certain amount of money for 10 years, and they're going to pay you a 3% interest rate, typically 1.5% every six months for 10 years. And then when the bond matures, they give you your original money back. So you're essentially making a loan for a certain period of time to that corporation. Now, treasuries are the government version of a bond. And there's all sorts of different types of treasuries. There's zero coupon bonds that the government issues. There's tips, which are inflation adjusted bonds. There's floating rate bonds, which are interest rate adjusted bonds. And actually the bond market can be even more complicated than the stock market. Um, 
but in general, interest rates dictate how well bonds do. Uh, when interest rates are low, the projected returns on bonds are low. And as interest rates rise, actually the value of bonds goes down as interest rates rise. So even though the interest that the bonds are going to be paying goes up, whatever bonds you already own go down in value. And so there's an inverse relationship between uh, bonds. And there's typically an inverse relationship between stocks and safe bonds. So highly rated company bonds, government bonds, those types of things. When stocks do well, they tend to not do as well. But when stocks get hit really hard, usually high quality bonds will go up in value. And so they provide some stability to portfolio. So if I understand correctly, bonds are actually a debt to the company. So if company has to pass on their profit, they have to take care of first the bondholders, and then it comes out dividend and the gain into the stock. Is that correct? I mean, stock obviously the gain in the stock price has a lot of speculation. But if company has to give out the profit, bondholders get the first take on that profit. Am I right? Absolutely. Yep. So they've got to pay their interest on their debt before they can pay a dividend. dividend. And it's you know if they get in financial hardship and they've they're going to foreclose on the company like General Motors a few years ago we had clients that owned bonds, uh, not that we had recommended those but you know they just owned them because we're a GM town, and um, they got a little bit of money left but stockholders got almost no money, and so the bondholders when a company goes under get paid first and what you know the, only a little bit that's left ends up going to the stockholders. If so that means bonds would be considered somewhat of a safer compared to stocks then? Compared to stocks, exactly, yep. But there are many different levels of risk in bonds. You can have okay. junk bonds all the way up to treasuries. And then you also can have a, like a fixed deposit at the banks also, right? Yep, absolutely. You can, the bank, you have FDIC insured investments in the bank like CDs or money market accounts or just strictly savings accounts. Those are probably the most conservative investments that you could imagine. Um, but of course, they pay the least. Usually, the way that investments work is the more risk you have, the more potential return you have, the less risk you have, the less potential return you have. Yeah, that, that's a good rule to remember that more risk, more risk you take, more potential return you get. And I think, so I think it's a person, like you said earlier, person based on the age group, person based on the risk taking. Uh, you know, uh, ability or profile and person having how large of a portfolio, the spread of each one of them would be different, which we'll talk about in a second. Absolutely. So, so my next question to which applies to in COVID-19 to all of us, uh, including uh, people who do well, that uh, typically how many months of reserve as a financial planner you advise everybody to have in terms of like one month, three months, six months? Yeah, so the, the rule of thumb is three to six months. So three months is if you've got two spouses that work and have pretty stable jobs and they've got disability insurance, you know, they've got a lot of protections in place, six months more for maybe the business owner that has unstable, you know, month to month income, that type of thing. I tend to err on the side of caution with cash. I, I personally for myself and for my clients like to have a little bit more reserves um, just because in situations like this, cash is king both for surviving and for taking advantage of opportunities that come along when things get crazy. Yeah, that's a good point. I think uh, six months reserve, in my opinion, is must for everybody. That means uh, some kind of a discipline to have a mandatory saving when the times are good. I think most people, and you can tell us more about it, most people forget to say when the times are good. They think that good time will continue for life, but those ups and downs is part of life with everything, not just with finances, Absolutely. with health, with jobs, with family, with everything, ups and downs happen. And that's when I think the down is the one when we have to survive. So please tell us some of the strategies, how people can save, even if they're making you know, a small amount of income right now, because they're in early stage of the life, early stage of career, Tell us some of the tricks uh, where people can save uh, money month to month, and then we'll talk about how they can invest. Yeah, so that's, again, a great question. I think the biggest way that I find that um, helps people to save and, and be disciplined at saving is to automate it. So it's pretty simple. Like with your 401k, you just select, I want to put such and such away in order to, uh, or save such and such every paycheck. In order to change that, you actually have to take a physical act of doing it. Right. So 
um, the discipline that it takes to stick to an eating plan or, or something like that, you're constantly have to make good, having to make good decisions. Whereas with investments, you can actually make it easier. You can have an automatic transfer every month from your bank account to an investment account. Uh, you can have an automatic deduction from your paycheck to do an investment account. And then you don't have to make good decisions all the time. We still should make good decisions with your finance, but as far as saving the money goes, it's already there, and then you just have the discipline of learning to live on what's left. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think if, uh, just like our retirement account, if the, something is deducted from our paycheck, and the money we see in the bank, if it's a direct deposit or a check we get every two weeks, if that money is already less compared to what we would have gotten, we probably will spend less. I think when the once the money hits our pocket, we start spending. So if it's taken out before it hits our pocket, and I think that's when many people don't realize that as small as $50 every paycheck, you know, can go long if you save it for 30, 40, 50 years. And you can always increase that every two week amount as your income grows. And I think uh, saving in my opinion in America, and you can tell me about it, saving in America, uh, not more than like 10% of people save every year. I think in Japan, it's almost like 60 or 70%. So I think as American, we don't save on a consistent base. Uh, we leave many times paycheck to paycheck because we spend out everything we make. So what is what do you think is in terms of uh, the statistics in terms of America versus other countries in terms of saving? I'm not sure what the statistics are of America relative to other countries, but I do know that America is not saving enough. Um, particularly the baby boomers have, have struggled to save enough for retirement. Uh, I think when you're in a country that's been so wealthy, you kind of take things for granted a little bit and think, well, you know, things are good. We're not going to have to worry about it. We're used to this, this um, uh, I don't want to call it easy, but, you know, good lifestyle and, and maybe we don't feel pressured or, or um, the need enough to, to save. We're also an instant gratification society for sure. We've got instant media of, I mean, at the tip on my phone, I can pull up five different streaming stations and entertain myself however long I want. So, you know, I think younger generations though, I've actually seen that are in the 20s and 30s, um, at least the ones that I'm meeting with seem to be more focused on saving and being a little bit more conservative with their finances, maybe because they've seen what their parents went through in 2008 um, or they were graduating around that time. But I do see a little bit of an uptick in, in the attitude towards savings with, with a little bit of 20s and 30s. Yeah, I think I agree. I think, uh, I think with the hard times uh, coming in 2008, 2007, 2008, now recently with COVID-19, people are realizing that uh, government cannot bail them out every time. Plus government cannot reproduce their lifestyle because they pay the stimulus checks from the governments are not going to replace your total income. So I think right. you need to have saving. I think, uh, plus I think I sincerely think that uh, we always have done that. Even when I was making, uh, you know, I was making like 15,000 a year, this was 30 years ago. My I, Myself and my wife, we were still saving about 10% of our income because we knew that that money would be needed for future purchase of a car or future health issue or future house purchase. So we always were saving. And I, I essentially advise all my friends and younger ones that you always save minimum 10% of your income. That means buying one less cloth or buying one less uh, you know, coffee or buying a, you're going one time less restaurant, but at least save 10% of your income every paycheck. So what do you think? I, you think 10% is a pretty fair number? I think that's probably the low end, um, but it's a great advice. I completely agree with that. Uh, 10 to 15 is kind of the, the um, you know, the standard or the norm that you, you hear. Uh, if there's, there's younger people listening right now in college or um, just getting their career job, I, I love meeting with them largely because I know how much of an impact the advice that I give can have on them because they're used to living on ramen noodles and mac and cheese, right? So they're used to living on almost nothing. When they get that first career job and they're finally making some money, it is very easy to put 10, 15, 20% of your income away and you're not going to feel it at all. But once you get used to living on it and then you have to give up something, then it's painful. And so, um, you know, if you've got kids that are, you've got, you're listening, you've got kids that are in a situation, that's one of the biggest pieces of advice that I can give is as soon as they start that career job, they start making real money, um, put that 10, 15, 20% away. 
Yeah, that's a that's a great piece of advice. I think it's almost like in health, it's easy not to gain weight, but it's very hard to lose the weight. Same way, if you start at age 25, just getting out of the college or your master's degree, and if you haven't seen those expensive cars and big houses and big vacations, you can easily, you know, just do one or two of less of that thing, but have a habit of saving 10, 15 percent. But if you get into those things and enjoy the money paycheck to paycheck for five years, it'd be hard to go back to living like a college student again. I agree. That's a great advice that, you know, start start as soon as you finish your degree, because you have not seen all the material thing in your life yet. So uh, my next question is, uh, so what are the tips in terms of the saving? If somebody is 25 years old, which many of our listeners, followers are, if somebody is 25 years old and has a 50, maybe even 70 years of, uh, of uh, investment life left into them and they have a stable income, they have a good degree, what do you think they should start? Should they start with like a stocks? Should they start with uh, like index funds? Should they start with bonds? What kind of advice do you have for a 25-year-old, then a 50-year-old, and then a 70 year old. Yeah, so the 25 year old, you're, um, for your longer term money, money that you're, they're putting away for 10, 15 or retirement, 10, 15 years of retirement, they're definitely gonna wanna be aggressive. Uh, we've also seen an uptick of younger people that wanna be more conservative. Um, but actually the longer your time horizon, the more aggressive you should be. So when you're young, you should almost be all stocks. My, my personal portfolio is almost all stocks. Um, I'm not even concerned about the downturns because frankly, not from my business standpoint, not from my client standpoint, um, but younger people like myself, when account values go down, you're still contributing, you're earning, you're putting your 401k dollars into it. So when it recovers, it's going to recover even better than it would have if it hadn't happened. So actually downturns can be really beneficial early on in, in your working career, as long as you continue to contribute. So be aggressive, stick to your contributions, even during tough times and uh, you know, discipline with that. The 50-year-old, as you get close to retirement and there's a lot of different situations that come into play with kids and education and different. So it's, it's harder to give specific advice there. It has to be more of a personal conversation with somebody. Um, but you definitely wanna start thinking about at 50 years old, um, do I need to reduce the risk that I'm taking? Uh, am I on pace to retire when I wanna retire and live the lifestyle I wanna So these are questions that um, you start asking yourself at that point, you know, are the kids through school yet? How much more do I have there? I don't know, do we want to have a second home when we retire? So a lot of planning starts to get involved in, in your 50s. And at 70, it's, it's mostly a, a distribution and retirement planning um, discussion. So retirement planning is all about inflows and outflows. How much you're spending relative to how much you have coming in. And then you have to determine when and how you're going to take distributions from your accounts. So I have clients that are in their 70s that don't need any income from their investments. They have, couple, they have both spouses have a pension, they have social security, they don't, they're not big spenders. And so they can still be pretty aggressive because they don't need to make withdrawals from their accounts, assuming that they have the risk tolerance for it. And then there's others that may um, maybe didn't save quite as much as, as they should sustain lifestyle. They're going to have to be a little bit more conservative because they're, they're constantly taking withdrawals from the accounts. And as you're taking withdrawals, you're essentially they're locking in gains or you're locking in losses. It's the opposite of being 25 years old where the market recovers. So keep contributing, you're going to be fine. Uh, when, when you're in your 70s and you're taking distributions or any point when you're taking distributions, if the market goes down and you still have to take those distributions, you're locking in those losses. So you have to be more careful. You have to do more strategic planning around setting aside a chunk of money that has no risk or little risk so that if the market goes down, you've got a pool of money you can pull from and not have to lock in the losses. Yeah, those are important things. And I think, uh, I sincerely think that even though we are gonna talk a lot of things in this one hour, uh, and just like I said earlier, I'm an expert cardiologist, I'm a lifestyle physician. And even, even with all the knowledge I have from reading about finances, I still need a financial planner. So I think, I sincerely think an average person, and I consider myself average in terms of financial knowledge, should have my opinion, expert opinion. And I think uh, even if you are starting small, I think there are a lot of financial planners who can help you at a much lower cost. And as you grow, you can get sophisticated and get into a, you know, more expert planners. But I think in my opinion, and I'll ask you as my last question that, 
you know, I think everybody, in my opinion, should have a, some kind of a personal uh, personal watch on their finances, at least quarterly, if not more often. So my next question to you is, uh, like, we always, like, when I was uh, in America, knew a lot of our seniors, a lot of our older friends, advisors that always buy the house. House is one of the biggest, biggest investment you can make. And when in 2006, 2007, the housing bubble broke and everybody lost money, they could not even sell their house. We all realized that maybe house is not the best investment. So my two questions to you, number one, is house a good investment in terms of uh, comparing the stock market return? And number two, uh, is house more of a, for a personal pleasure or is it something uh, we need to have it for like a tax deduction or any kind of, uh, any kind of financial benefit? Yeah, no, I think the traditional thought is the uh, house is a is a significant asset, and it is a significant asset. I don't think it's a great investment in general, but we've got to live somewhere, right? So it's either rent and not build up any equity in that asset uh, or buy a home. Uh, some areas, home ownership has been a, a great investment. You know, you look at certain areas of California or parts of the country where, where home prices have gone up significantly in our area, Dr. Shah in Michigan, it hasn't been a great investment as far as, you know, just a pure rate of return goes. But when you compare it, you know, within you and property taxes into that and, and other costs of maintenance that goes along with a house, um, really your rate of return in most areas is not going to be great, um, but it's going to be better than renting. Um, but we have seen an uptick in renting too, because people just realize, well, I don't really want to mow the lawn and I don't want to do the maintenance, so there's, there's uh, stress and time decisions made there. Uh, and then what was the second part of your question? Like is house, a lot of people buy house to get a deduction in the tax return. And is that a good strategy to buy a bigger house because you get a better, bigger deduction? I think in my opinion, we should buy the house which we need, what our physical needs are, what our emotional needs are, what we will enjoy. And like you said, whether we like to take care of the house, mow the yard, clean the snow and everything else. So is is house, we should buy it so we can get a bigger tax deduction or is this something we should own only what we need to own? Yeah, so spending money to get a tax deduction is going to equal out a negative, right? So we think of it's tax deductions really in my mind more of an ancillary benefit. I'm just, you know, like I'm doing this, but this tax deduction is is you know that's great too, kind of a thing. Um, because if you spend money, even if a business spends money, if if we spend money uh, on a house so we can get a bigger tax deduction, we're still spending the money. We're saving a little bit. It's also with the new tax laws. Um, there's limitations on how much you can deduct for property taxes, for interest on your mortgage, um, for different things. So um, not so much in our area, we don't really see it very often where it exceeds those limits, but in other areas, there's limitations on what you can deduct now. Yeah, I think I, the, the way I understood that if you spend a dollar to get 30 cent deduction, you still loss of 70 cents if you did not exactly. have to spend that dollar, you know? Exactly. You might as well save the whole dollar pay 30 cent tax and keep 70 cent for yourself instead of giving out that dollar. My next question, which is also a very important question for, we are kind of done with it. We are almost done with it, I should say. But a lot of young parents, a lot of, uh, lot of parents uh, in their 40s are having kids. So what do you recommend in terms of how they can take care of kids' education? I learned something great uh, from one of my nurse practitioners yesterday, that kids, need to do four things. One, they need to get 25% into scholarship. 25% they need to earn themselves by working on the weekends. 25% can come from parents and 25% can come from taking their own loans for the college. So what, how do you recommend to take care of kids' education for college? Yeah, I think I think a diversified approach is, is the best approach. I think the days of financing all of a uh, four or five year degree and then a master's degree and then a doctorate and having $300,000 in debt, people are realizing really quickly that that it takes so many years to dig out of it. Um, but, you know, parents, I find some parents, it's very, it's very across the board. Some parents want to provide all the uh, money for the education because that's what their parents did or um, their parents didn't and they had to work so hard to get through school. Uh, and others say, you know, it's, it's up to the, it's up to the students, up to the kids. So, 
and there's a, a wide range there. Uh, but I think a diverse approach, like you, you talked about, is encouraging them to do work on their studies, encouraging them to do work on the weekends. Maybe they need to get a little bit in loans. That's fine. Um, and then the parents help out. That's, I mean, that's a great strategy. As far as saving vehicles for the parents, I mean, there's a couple different options. Um, 529 plans are one of the most popular. Uh, are kind of like a Roth IRA, where you put money in, you, you can get some state tax benefits with the contributions to the 529 plan, but then they grow tax first, so they, they accumulate without taxes. And as long as it's spent on, on education, um, it's a tax free distribution. So you put 10,000 a day, 10 years from now, you pull out, pay for tuition, and it's worth 20,000, there's no taxes on it. You have to be careful you don't overfund those ones in particular. Because if you overfund them and it's left over, it's a penalty to take penalty and taxes to take money out for anything other than education. Um, I also like a Roth IRA as a savings vehicle. If if you're eligible to do it, you don't make too much income. Um, because the Roth IRA, you're allowed to take distributions from a Roth IRA of your principal um, at any point without a contributory Roth IRA, without a penalty or taxes. So you put fifty thousand in over the next several years, and you take fifty thousand out at any time just for education. But if you don't use it for education, you just leave it and let it grow for retirement, and you have kind of a multi-use vehicle, and you don't have to worry about, you know, what if my what if my child gets a full scholarship, or what if they go to a school that's a lot less expensive than I anticipated. Hopefully, yeah, those that, things happen. But yeah, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Uh, I think let's talk a little bit about invest, investing itself. So if people have some money, unfortunately, some people you know, have lost their job and they don't have much money to invest, but the jobs are coming back. People are getting back, like hospitals are getting busier. Some businesses are opening up again. So if they want to invest any money, what are the options? And what is the, there's a something popular option called ETF funds. So please explain what is the ETF fund and how people can invest into it. Yeah, so an ETF is a, it's very much like a mutual fund. So it's a pooled investment vehicle where um, you have a lot of different, usually a lot of different investment holdings, it can be stocks, bonds, um, futures, oil type thing, energy, gold. You see, you can buy any, there's over 5,000 different types of ETF, or 5,000 different ETFs. Um, you can buy them in just about any investment you can imagine. Um, but they are trade more like a stock. So you can, you can buy in and out of them daily, uh, within the day. Um, they're actually usually lower cost than what a mutual fund would be. So they're very similar to a mutual fund, but they trade, they can trade throughout the day, whereas a mutual fund, um, you can just make one, one decision each day. You can buy or sell once a day, and then it set at, the, at the market close, that's when you, the transaction happens. Whereas an ETF, you can do it throughout the day um, mutual funds tend to have higher costs um, because there are a lot more of them are actively managed. ETFs for certain C actively managed funds, meaning you've got a manager that's selecting specific stocks or specific bonds to try to outform the market. Um, but for the most part, ETFs are um, passive index, meaning they're just following the S&P 500 or following a different type of stock. Um, they're a very popular vehicle. We like them. I think they're they're when on the right you can put you can put together a great portfolio using ETFs. Okay. Um, and then, you know today in today's world, anybody with a computer um, can can hop online and open a brokerage account at any one of the brokers, and most of them are, are transaction free for ETFs and stocks anymore. Um, so it's it's pretty darn easy to open an account and start investing. I think that's an excellent point. I think with the, with the computer knowledge all the kids and everybody has, they can easily open an account, just start putting some small amount every two weeks, and before they know it, they will have lots of good reserve built in. So I think, uh, I think with the technology, I remember when we came to this country, we had to do everything over the phone and uh, you know, buying, selling, and reaching them. And I think uh, those days are gone. Now with the one click, you can buy, you can sell, I mean, those obviously brings in a lot of risk also because you may, without even your knowledge, may become a day trader. And before you know, you start to lose money. So I think it goes both ways. So my next question to you is, uh, is a gold a good investment? Everybody says that you should have a small amount of your portfolio into gold because gold has been a kind of stable investment. So is gold a good investment? 
Gold is a great diversifier. It tends to perform differently than stocks or bonds. And so it, it helps to provide balance to a portfolio. Uh, you know, when stocks are going down and bonds are going up and gold's doing something completely different, it helps to stabilize returns and reduce some of the volatility by having an asset like gold in the portfolio um, just to diversify it. Uh, historically, gold returns have not been great. They've been okay. You know, so as far as you just look at gold, like how great of an investment is gold, it's okay. It, it would be my answer. Uh, but it's a good diversifier. And so that's why people like to have a small percentage of their portfolio. A lot of experts recommend that. Um, it's also kind of a fallback currency. So when the governments of the world are, are there's, there's uncertainty out there, people tend to fall back a little bit on gold. Okay, that makes sense. And what do you think in terms of some of those commodities, including oil, like people buy all those things because those things are always going to be needed by the people. We have to eat, we have to drive the car. So I think, is there any value in investing into some of those commodities? Yeah, commodities also provide, I would consider gold a commodity. Um, it'd be right in that same category. Um, they provide diversification to a portfolio, but in and of themselves, they don't produce anything, right? So if you buy oil, for example, the price fluctuates, but the oil is not out working and making a dividend and paying you money. Um, and so a lot of times you'll see recommendations to for rather than buy oil futures or oil directly, you would buy companies that are oil related because they're doing things that produce an income, they produce funds and then they pay, pay a dividend or their price goes up and so they're actively working. Whereas just buying gold or just buying oil, they're just physical assets, right? Um, in the last 10 years, you know, oil has not been a great investment. And we'll see with, with the way, you know, energy is in the world and alternative energy becoming more prominent and uh, the technology for fracking, you know, I think oil's got a cap on what it could do up on the upside. Because once it gets to a certain point, there's almost not unlimited reserves, but there's a lot of oil in the, uh, that can be tapped into with fracking. Fracking, makes sense, yeah. So let's just change the gears now. In terms of the insurance, we all typically carry health insurance, but what are the other insurances one should carry? We obviously carry car insurance, house insurance, but sure. we also want to know more about like uh, your liability insurance, your long-term insurance, uh, your disability insurance. What are those insurance and how much a person should have? No, that's a great question. It's it's insurance is one of those things that it's it's almost painful to pay the premiums because you're you're hoping that you never have to use it, right? So you're paying for, for something that you hope you never have to use. But I would say one of the most overlooked types of insurance is an umbrella policy, umbrella liability policy, um, because there are limits on on auto policies and home policies on um, what they cover when you get sued. Especially for for clients that are are wealthier and have assets, I would recommend larger uh, umbrella policies to protect them. Of course, for those that doctors and the in the professional trades want to make sure they have good professional liability insurance as well. I think that's probably pretty obvious for those in, in those professions. Uh, long term care insurance. I personally own long term care insurance. My wife works at a nursing home. Uh, she's a social worker. And I, I have seen how expensive long-term care can be when you're young. You can pay pretty, um, pretty low premium, get a pretty good benefit. Um, as you get older, in your 60s and 70s, the costs go up significantly. Um, also, if you're a business owner, there are a lot of ways to deduct long-term care premiums as health insurance premiums. So that can be a decision. Not really for everybody. There's a lot of people that have significant assets that can self-insure. Um, and long-term care insurance companies in general, we, there used to be a ton of companies offering it. Uh, then they realized that people were, were making claims a lot more often than they expected. And so now there's really only a few good companies that are offering it and the premiums have gone up. And so it's, it's a definitely an individualized uh, decision, um, but it's, it's obviously 50% of people are gonna have some sort of long-term care event in their lives. Yeah, that's a good point. I think uh, for buying long-term uh, health, in long-term care insurance, definitely one needs an expert advice. I think uh, that's just complex enough, depending upon how much your assets you have, how much uh, cap is on the 
you know, the money they're going to pay out and all those things and how much the premium is. So how about in terms of life insurance? What is the role of uh, like a term life insurance and what the traditional life insurance? Yeah, life insurance is very important, especially when you, you have a young family. Um, that's really the, the, the most important part of life insurance is to protect your family from um, the loss of your income or the loss of you as for a stay-at-home spouse. They're providing a lot of support for the family that all of a sudden is going to be gone and uh, need to be replaced somehow. Now, your loved ones are going through the most traumatic event of their lives. Um, you want to make sure that they're not having to worry about having to worry about money at that time. Um, so term life insurance is typically the best fit for the, that younger situation, younger family, um, because you can buy a lot of coverage for a small premium. Um, as you get to a certain point where you're looking at either accumulating wealth or passing wealth on to the next generation, uh, that's, that's when we would look at um, whole life or universal life or more permanent types of life insurance uh, where the main benefit of that life insurance, well, two main benefits. One is leverage. So you're paying a premium of, let's just call it $10,000 and you're getting a million dollar policy, right? So you're, you're leveraging your assets to increase what goes to the next generation. Um, but number two is that that benefit on life insurance is in tax free and also not all situations, but in most situations. And so you're, you're leveraging your assets and getting an income tax free um, benefit for, for your loved ones. And it's also most of these, most of the insurance companies, that, all the insurance companies that we use but, uh, are AAA rated, you know, high quality companies. And so you're looking at, if you look at it from a rate of return standpoint, like an investment standpoint, if you are going to leave money to the next generation anyway, life insurance can make sense. No, I think that's an excellent point. Like when, when I came to this country, I was like 23 years old and I got my first job at like 24, 25 and they were offering a term life insurance and I ended up buying a level term insurance for 20 years for like such a cheap price for 500,000. Mm -hmm. And I think I, my point was that if I, something happens to me with a young son, daughter wasn't born yet, young son and my wife, I mean, how would they take care? I mean, they obviously they will figure out themselves after I'm gone. But at least first five years, why they go to school again, find a better job, take care of some financial obligations, healthcare costs, you know, in case if I had healthcare costs before I die, all those things require uh, life insurance. And I think for a younger family to have a term life insurance has been a boon. I think many of our younger friends in their 20s and 30s, I would advise them to get a term life insurance at least for like a three or four times of the income. So that's my next question. What is the typical size of the life insurance they should have? Like five star income, five times that income? What is the typical number? Yeah, I would say typical number would be more like 10 times or more in my yeah. mind for a young family. Because, you know, especially especially for the, uh, like a main breadwinner type of situation, because you don't, you know, you want the mortgage paid off. You want them not to worry about money for a little while, but you also may want to provide for um, education for the kids, right? That can be expensive. So the younger you are, the younger your family is, I think that multiple is higher in my mind. Uh, I think I have like something like 15 times earnings for myself personally, I think 10 to 20 in that range. Because, you know, million dollar policy for a lot of healthy 20, 30 some year olds is 40 bucks a month. You know, it's so minimal, it's, it's almost a why not. I think that's an excellent point. I mean, to all of our listeners who are in their young age in 20s, 30s, and 40s, definitely get a term life insurance if you have family. If you're single, I can understand, but if you have a family, if you have kids, a term life insurance is a must, it's one of the most soundest advice anybody can get from financial planner or even from a friend. So my next uh, last question to you is uh, everybody, you know, even though I don't want to retire, I want to work until my last day of my life, maybe 110. I don't want to retire. I'll be doing some kind of work. But a lot of people I meet, they said, oh, I'm, I want to retire. I want to retire. And they all want to retire in their young age, quote unquote, so they can enjoy their life physically. They can go out and play sports and go skiing and this and that. So what is the about number of uh, their, their expenses per year? how much more percentage wise or amount number of times wise they should have to retire. For example, if somebody's expenses per year is 100,000, how much money they will need to retire and maintain the same lifestyle? I would say it's very situational. Um, I'd say on the low end, it'd be like 70,000, 70%. 70%. 
Um, on the high end, it would actually be in the first healthy years of retirement, actually more than what they're spending right now. Uh, we've, we've seen that where now all of a sudden we can travel. We want to get that place down in Florida. You know, they, they're actually spending more when they retire than, than what they did before. Um, taxes typically go down, but not always. So for example, if they if they are spending right now 100,000 a year total expense, including all the taxes, including house, everything else, 100,000 a year. So they will need to have a 100,000 of income from all their investments and all their assets to retire. Am I understanding right? In some cases, yes. In, some, in other cases, it might be more like 70,000. 70. You know, so let's, let's see 70. Yeah. Let's see 70,000. And if you take an average return uh, with stocks, bonds, and treasuries, and everything else of about 5% a year, so 70,000, 70, 5% uh, would be what? Uh, about uh, how much? A uh, million, 1.3, right in that range? 1. Point. So they have to have 1.3 million to retire to have a 70,000 income per year. Yeah, well, if they, if they don't have a pension, and we have to factor in social security, right? So let's say social security is 20,000 a year. So that means that would take that number down to 50,000 a year that they'd have to pull from their investments. So then you're looking at more like a million dollars. Yeah. Uh, they've got a pension of 30,000, you know, so lots of factors involved there, or maybe they have rental properties or whatever, other income from other sources, but yeah, that's no, the I concept. Think, yeah. I think that that brings up the last point that all this thing we talk, is so complex. Just retirement itself is so complex that how much money you will need to have that passive income from your investments, from all kinds of assets and everything to be comfortable in terms of spending during your retirement because you don't retire for five years and then look for a job. That doesn't make sense. So I think, uh, so I think to me, person like you, who's been a great advisor to us, great advisor to many young people, many professionals, I think uh, is a must. So tell us, uh, number one, what are some of the good companies uh, which they can be part of? And if, if somebody wants to go with your company or with you, how can they connect with you? Sure, yeah, I, I would say, I, I don't know if I wanna mention specific companies, but I can give you some characteristics of good financial planning, good financial advising companies. I think the first would be uh, an independent company. So um, somebody that doesn't have a sales quota of some sort from a, from a larger institution. Uh, a fiduciary company, so an investment advisor, there's brokers and there's investment advisors. Uh, I believe that investment advisors um, are more, their interests are more in line with their clients. Um, so make sure they're a fiduciary. Um, the other one would be is there's a lot of qualified people out there uh, that have advanced designations to a financial planner, and there's a lot that don't. Um, but there's plenty to choose from that do. So I think I would start, if I'm, if I'm looking for a financial advisor, I start with making sure they have good qualifications. Because I will tell you, I was a junior in college when I got my, um, my securities license and I could call myself a financial advisor, but I didn't really know all that much. Uh, it's pretty easy to become a financial advisor. You don't have to have a master's degree or a law degree or a doctorate. Uh, and so I would, I would start with independent uh, fiduciary and an investigation. And then from there, when you meet with the person, um, make sure that they're talking more about you and asking more about your situation than they are talking about. Um, and, and also it's really important that you can connect with them, that you like them, that you can trust them um, because this is somebody you're gonna be working with in a trusted relationship, uh, usually for a very long period of time. So that was be my piece of advice. If somebody's interested in working with me, uh, or one of our advisors with our company, um, you can um, check us out at our website, which is uh, www.fsgmichigan.com. Uh, fsgmichigan.com is a financial strategies group, michigan.com. Uh, or you can email me at the same, just Brandon, B-R-A-N-D-O-N, at fsgmichigan.com. Um, and I'm happy to, if, if I'm not able to um, Work with them individually, I will definitely place them with, with one of our advisors. We have, out of our advisors, we have five certified financial plan designations, I think four chartered financial consultant, a couple of master's degrees, um, a JD, MBA. So we, our advisors are really well educated. No, that's great. So again, it's FSG is the company's name. 
And if you want to uh, email Brandon, it's a brandon at fsgmichigan.com. Uh, again, Brandon, thank you. Uh, thank you to all of our for me. all of our listeners. Uh, again, this video, this live will be on YouTube soon. Uh, we are expanding into different pillars. We are not just talking about health anymore. We are not just talking about happiness. We are talking about everything which actually is uh, necessary to be a successful, happy, healthy, long-living person. And that includes financial health. That includes parenting. That includes being a strong woman. That includes uh, many other things. So we are bringing you all different aspects of just be becoming a successful person. So thanks, Brennan, again. We'll bring you back in a thank year. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.